Well, it is wonderful to be with you guys this morning. And first of all, uh, we have a lot of announcements this morning, but I want to continue by saying that I'm thankful for those of you who are here on Thursday night uh, to help with the SWBA meeting. I'm very thankful for the way that we represented ourselves in hosting the SWBA annual meeting, and I've got uh, a lot of compliments on our church. And just want to let you know that there are a lot of people that are hopeful and really looking forward to what the Lord is doing here at IHBC. Uh, and as you likely know, Costume Movie Night is coming up this Friday. Absolutely. Yeah, very exciting. And even more exciting than that, perhaps, is uh, that we've had a huge response so far. Uh, almost as big already as the Fall Festival. And we're still a week out, so in all likelihood, movie night this Friday will be bigger than the Fall Festival was, so we'll see. Uh, and you know how big that was, so get your costumes out, family-friendly and church-friendly, of course, and come and help us entertain our friends and neighbors, and it should be a lot of fun. What we've seen so far this year is that the three most attended Sunday worship services have directly coincided with big events. What's happened is the most attended Sunday was the one immediately following VBS. That was the second highest attendance that this church had seen in several years. And the second highest attended service this year was Easter Sunday. And can you guess what the third most attended service of the year was? The one immediately following the Fall Festival. So what we see is exactly what we expect, that big dates and big events, they convert into visitors on Sunday morning. And we're seeing a lot of young families and kids at our outreach events, which is exactly what we want, because we all agree that getting younger is a high priority of this church, and young people are essential to the future of the kingdom in Grant County. And just an update, since we're talking about bringing people into the church, Women Together starts a new Bible study Monday night, and between the two classes, that group's running about 22 or 23 strong right now. Temple Fitness is growing. They had 11 there on Friday. Arise Sunday nights is consistently in the 20s. We had visitors last week. The men's breakfast is consistently in the teens. Several of you have brought visitors there. So all in all, very good job. And uh, this week we have visitors who've moved here from out of town and they found us through our website. So all that to say, we're getting the word out and people are responding. Uh, things are going just as we hope that they will. And our direction and our vision uh, for creating places to open more doors, to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to move people from not being in church to being actively involved members in church is happening. It's working. And God is moving in this church. He's moving through this church. And this is just the beginning. Christmas is right around the corner. Advent season. It's a big time for the church. And we're going to aim to do it well and to live up to the calling to make much of the birth of our Savior. So be encouraged and be involved because it's starting to get exciting and it's about to get very fun. And I expect that if you get involved and you keep your eyes open that you're likely going to see some amazing things happen here. You're likely going to have a great time in the process. So this morning, we are back in the book of Ephesians. We took a week off last week and now we are back. We're in chapter 6. And when we left off in Ephesians, Paul had been talking about the theme of submitting to one another. It's a theme that he started in chapter 5, verse 21, when he said, As Christians, we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And he then moved to talking about husbands and wives and their roles in marriage. And today, in Ephesians 6, he moves from marriage to parenting. So let's read the text together. It's Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 1. And then I'll pray for us and we'll talk about the text. It's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, where Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask you that you would open up this word to us, open our hearts to receive it, that you would make us good fathers, that you would make us good parents, that you would make us good grandparents, that you would make us a people who loves young people. 
that we would disciple those younger than us well. Pray that you would bring up the children of this community in the way, and that you would use us however you see fit to do that. It's by the aid of your spirit and in the matchless authority of your Son, Jesus Christ, to you, Father, we pray. Amen. Well, there's an interesting story that I want to share with you, and it's told by Randy Stinson. He's uh, one of the foremost voices on Christian family. And he tells the story of an unknown scientist named Max Sherman. Sherman is an energy efficiency scientist who's most notable for research that he did examining the effectiveness of sealants in heating and air conditioning systems. Sounds very interesting, right? It is interesting, though, his findings. And in Home Energy magazine, he wrote an article that was later picked up by USA Today and the Wall Street Journal and practically every other major publication after that. And in this article, he reported his findings from tests that he performed on duct sealants. Now here's what's notable. In those tests, he found that most duct sealants work consistently and effectively. They all work with the exception of one surprising product. Can anybody guess what that notable product is? Exactly right. Duct tape. Of all the tested duct sealants, duct tape has been found to fail reliably and often catastrophically when used for its created purpose in duct systems. And so Sherman, he took to blogging, answering the kind of questions you might expect. How did duct tape get its name? I don't know. What can you use it for? Anything but ducts. <laughs> Do you use duct tape? All the time, just not on ducts. So what's the point? The point is that what made Sherman's findings so noteworthy, why they got so much coverage, is the prevailing notion that says that you can fix practically anything with duct tape. It's been said that duct tape is the stuff that holds the whole world together. But as Sherman found, lab experiments have proven that duct tape, as it's generally used, should not be used for sealing ducts. And so ironically, while duct tape is exceedingly fantastic and proven useful for so many tasks, it fails miserably in the purpose for which it was created. It does nothing to perform its intended purpose. It's actually more harmful than it is good. Today, we're talking about God's intended purpose for parents. And we see more and more all the time that parents' lives are increasingly centered around their children. Parents find themselves doing exceedingly more for their children all the time, running them around from place to place and finding any number of ways to serve their children's perceived needs all the time. Family schedules, calendars are now built around children's activities. Parents endure and strive and sacrifice and contend for all these activities when it comes to taking care of their children. And parents are proving exceedingly useful in chauffeuring and entertaining and serving their kids. But in our culture, we increasingly more all the time see that parents are actually failing in their original intended purpose, which is to cultivate in their children godliness and Christian virtue. We're busy raising the next professional baseball players, straight-A students and future scholarship recipients, doctors and future world leaders, all potentially good things but all while failing in the one most important thing. That's the spiritual development of the children in our culture. It's become an afterthought instead of the first thought. And echoing the clear teaching of Scripture, Randy Stenson says, parents should bring more energy, willingness, uh, sacrifice, and inclination for endurance to the task of their children's discipleship than to any other responsibility. And he means it, too. And I know it. He and his wife Dana, they have about ten children, I don't know, something like that. And most of them adopted, and they're an amazing family and intimidatingly well-ordered. And he is right. As parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, members of the body of Christ, we need to evaluate ourselves and our church and our situation. Are we raising our children? The children in our homes, our grown children, our grandchildren, the children in our church and in our community. 
Are we raising them in the way? Is our first concern to raise our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord? Are we taking intentional steps to do so? Because it's wonderful to raise happy children. I want happy children. And I think it's natural and good to want to provide a better life for our children. To provide a more prosperous life for the next generation than for the last. Just as it's wonderful that duct tape exceeds in proving useful for so many things, like bringing the Apollo 13 back from the moon, for instance. It did, and if you don't believe me, you watch the movie and you'll see. But it can't seal a duct. It fails in its intended purpose. And so I ask, are we being entrusted with young souls designed by God to be the primary influencers of their faith and spiritual development, are we striving to fulfill God's intended purpose for us? Or are we faltering in God's purpose for us in the lives of children? Because we could do an endless number of things well, and we could dedicate every moment of time and every ounce of energy to caring for our children. But if we falter in our intended purpose, to raise these children entrusted to us as we're called according to his purpose. To give them every chance to grow up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Then we fail them. We need to repent. We need to strive to do better by the children around us. This isn't to say that if you've raised your children in the way and you did all you could to, discipline, or to disciple them and they walked away from the faith, it's not to say that you failed each person's faith is their own. Grown people make their own decisions. And I pray for these people. Pray for your children who are far from the Lord right now. I believe that the Lord is sovereign and that he has the ability to call them back. But where we fail to answer the spiritual needs of our children, the children around us, can we see the catastrophic results of this? Can we recognize it in our culture? This is the most spiritually difficult time for children in the history of America. Families are broken. Parents aren't seeking the Lord or going to church. Schools are teaching towards standardized testing rather than teaching children to think. And in all our social spheres, we've lost our sense of reverence for the sacred and our respect for authority. And you look around and you can see it all over the culture. The trouble in our homes, it's pouring out into our streets. Dr. Timothy Kimmel, he's the executive director of Family Matters Ministry. He says there's no doubt that home is where life is making up its mind. Think of the key points of influence within our culture and you'll realize that their capacity for good or for ill is determined by the quality of the people within homes. The health and the strength of the family determines the integrity of our business community, the morality of our arts and entertainment the health of our churches, the conscience of our political leaders, the character of our military and police force, the heart of our educational system, the ethics of our scientific community, and the compassion of our social welfare services. The children of our community need us, and we're called to answer this need. Psalm 78 says, God established a testimony in Jacob. He appointed a law in Israel. He commanded our fathers to teach to the children that the next generation might know. The children yet unborn, that we would arise and tell God's truths to the children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Like the Ethiopian eunuch said to Philip, he said, how can I understand unless someone guides me? Paul says in Romans 10, how can they hear of the gospel and the things of God unless they have someone to tell them? This is a great time for us to speak about these issues. So we're going to have dozens of kids out here at our church on Friday night. We already have about 15 kids that are here during the week at Women Together. Those kids need the church. Their parents need our help. We're about to roll out our children's church initiative to help continue to make this an increasingly excellent place for families to come to church where parents will be encouraged to raise their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, and where parents will know that they'll be supported and equipped and have allies in raising their children. It's crucially important 
that we become a church that takes our role in the lives of young families and children very seriously. The future of this church depends on it. The young families and the children of this community, while they probably don't know it yet, they're depending on us. The future of this community, the quality of all the days of their lives and their eternal salvation all depend on it. And so this begs the question, what are they depending on? What is it that the Bible asks of us? What is the Bible's prescriptive instruction for raising children right? And Paul instructs us here in Ephesians 6, it begins in the home. It begins with clearly understanding the relation of the members of the family to one another, consistently instructing, encouraging, and supporting each one to effectively perform the function for which they're designed. Many of you know that I've struggled as a husband and a father in the beginning. I've told you that. And it was another man who's just a, a year older than me. But he'd been married quite a bit longer than I had. And he related to me. He empathized with me. He had compassion for me. He discipled me. He taught me. He didn't wait for me to come to church. He didn't try to force me to sit down with the Bible. He came to me, he hung out with me, he befriended me. And he taught me truths from the Bible. Without my even really knowing it, he was teaching me how to be a family man. Further, how to be a godly man. And I love this man so much. And we ended up becoming best friends for almost ten years. As some of you guys know, the reason I get so choked up talking about him is because he passed away in his sleep. Not that long ago. It still breaks my heart. But God used him in a huge way in my life. And that's what hurting people around us need. They need compassionate people like us to befriend them and to bring the wisdom of the scripture to them so they can experience God's healing in their lives. And the families around us, they need to hear the truth of God. Mothers and fathers need to know that living into the God-ordained design and role for parents and children is the beginning of peace in our homes. It's the beginning of restoration in our families. It's wisdom in raising spiritually healthy children. It's the bedrock of a healthy society. In the text here, Paul addresses the, Paul addresses the issue of family from two directions. The first he points to God's role for children in the family. Children are to honor and obey their parents. Second, says that God commands parents to follow his example. He is a perfect father, and he provides a perfect model. As a reflection of the Trinity, the Trinitarian nature of God, Paul's been outlining for us how God's created the social structures of his creation to work. Paul's referred to this mystery that in the Trinity has laid out God's blueprint for relational order and for grace and peace. And that the social structures he's created, they reflect this mystery. That in the Trinity we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, equal in dignity, three in personhood, one in essence. We see the Son is begotten of the Father, the Son submits to the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. In the body of Christ, we see Christ the head. We see leaders of the church. Men called to God and raised up by the saints to shepherd. Submit to and give an account to Christ. And the saints revere these leaders and follow them in reverence for Christ. Likewise, Paul told us at the end of Ephesians 5, marriage is a reflection of this Trinitarian structure. The husband submits to Christ. He loves and nurtures his wife in the way Christ loves the church. The wife respects and follows the husband. And today, regarding the family, Paul's explaining the structural formation of the family in the same way. In the first chapter of Genesis, God says to the Son and to the Spirit, He says, Let us make man in our image. As a reflection of the Trinity, God creates the husband for a unique position of responsibility. The wife then, Taken from the rib of the man, like the son who sits at the right hand of the father, the woman in traditional etiquette, she walks at the right hand of the man. As the Holy Spirit proceeds from the father and the son, 
is obedient to the will of the Father and the Son, children proceed from the husband and the wife, and they're to honor and obey their parents. As Warren Wiersbe points out, this is the prescription for harmony in the home. The wife submits to the husband as unto Christ. The husband loves his wife as Christ loves the church, and the children obey in the Lord. Paul says here in verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. This is God's desire for children, that they honor and obey. Paul says this is right. Not just that they honor and obey, but that they do so in reverence to the Lord. And what this means is that behavior that dishonors parents is dishonoring to God. And this commandment that Paul refers to in verse 2 is the fifth of the Ten Commandments. It's the first of which comes with a promise. That in honoring your father and mother, things will go well with you. You can expect to live a long life on the earth. This isn't a certain promise. Certainly there are exceptions. It's a general principle, like a proverb, that a child who honors God's wisdom, who obeys their parents, they can generally expect to avoid the dangers of sinful living, of a life that spurns parents' good instruction and the pitfalls of living distant from God. And the underlying reality is that imitating Christ in obedience always brings flourishing and always enriches us, but sin always deceives and ultimately robs us. But a person, a child, who lives well, who lives in accordance with God's will, who honors and obeys good instruction of their parents, can expect to live a rewarding, flourishing life. And having given God's command for children, Paul then turns to God's desire for parents. He says that parents should not provoke their children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And this is a short but loaded command. There's a lot going on here. In this one verse, most simply, we see that parents are to follow the example set forth in the character of God the Father. He is a perfect Father. He provides a perfect model. And the word for fathers here in verse 4, in the Greek, can also include mothers. It could be read as parents. But I would suggest that as spiritual leaders, given the specific condition of the state of fatherhood generally in our nation today, that fathers need to take this command personally to heart. We're to follow God's model. The father has a plan and he's intentional. He's loving but ordered. He's just but gracious. He disciplines but is patient. The love of his children brings him glory. Ultimately, he works all things for his children's good. Likewise, when we as parents do our part well, we set our kids up to live meaningful and God-honoring lives. And Dr. Tim Kimmel, he says, we can't assume that discovering and connecting to the hearts of our kids happens simply because we're their parents. You obviously love your children, but loving them doesn't automatically ensure a strong connection with their hearts. There's a level of sophistication we need to develop that empowers us to not only love our children, but to turn the love into a potent influence for good in every dimension of their lives. It's about being proactive rather than reactive. It's about being intentional. It's about developing godly character. It's about having a plan. It's about being loving but ordered, just but gracious, providing discipline that's marked with patience. In verse 4, Paul says we're to raise our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It's like two sides of a coin. Instruction and discipline. We can't effectively impart one without the other. Constant discipline with no instruction leads a child to hopelessness. And conversely, all the instruction with no discipline leads a child to lawlessness. And the deep, deep truth is this. No matter how well-meaning a parent may be, to withhold either discipline or instruction from a child is a form of neglect. It's the opposite of love. It leaves children morally confused. Tom Julian points out that children who have 
only instruction will think that they should obey only when they're convinced that they should. Children who receive only discipline, they never grow to be able to reason right and wrong for themselves, and they can't grow into moral adulthood. Ultimately, what we know is that children who disobey and disrespect parents grow to disrespect and disobey authority and ultimately become adults who disobey God. Paul says we're to instruct children. We need to honor their dignity as intelligent and thinking people and as their instructors to have high expectations of them, to respect them as thinking people entrusted to our care with the responsibility to teach them to think Christianly. Paul says, fathers, bring up your children in the instruction of the Lord. The onus for instructing children in the things of God is on the parents. This goes all the way back to Deuteronomy 6, to the time of Moses, where he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. As parents are the primary influencers of their children by design. Which means that we as the church, as a community, we need to come around these families, we need to encourage and support these parents, we need to help them in instructing their children in the Lord and raising their children to think Christianly. As the church, we bear the responsibility to support the family, to encourage fathers into fatherhood, to encourage them to own their role as the spiritual leaders of their homes, to equip mothers and fathers to instruct their children in the way, to come alongside them and to support them in every way that we can. And what we see in God's design is that pastors model the love of God to the church. The church models love for God to the parents, and the parents model love for God to the children. In verse 4 here, Paul says, don't merely raise your children in the instruction of the Lord, but raise them with discipline. We see again that this is a reflection of the good character of the Father. We know that our Father in heaven, he is perfect in his instruction, and he's communicated to us his will. He pairs that instruction with discipline. Hebrews 12 says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. It's for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father doesn't discipline? If you're left without discipline in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best for them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. In the character of God, we see that a good parent disciplines their children. And the concept of discipline, it's not one that, or it's one that's come under fire in our culture in the last few decades, and increasingly we're seeing a failure in many parents to truly discipline their children. We're seeing those parents who do see it as right and good to discipline their children are being shamed by many voices in our culture. But do we see the result of disciplineless parenting running rampant in our culture? What a travesty it is, the disservice that we do to our children by failing to discipline them, and then running around accusing them of not knowing how to act. We see the damage created by the lack of discipline in the pages of Scripture. David pampered Absalom, set him a bad example. The results were tragic for Israel. Eli failed his sons. They brought disgrace to his name in the defeat of the nation of Israel. In his latter years, even Isaac favored Esau, while Rebekah favored Jacob. 
they found themselves with a house divided. The child who receives only coddling and encouragement, regardless of their behavior, never receives correction or discipline where they behave poorly. It's like a child who goes by on a diet of only candy. This will receive approval of the children, certainly. It may keep them smiling, at least for a time. It's only a matter of time before that smile turns black with tooth decay. And in a diet of all encouragement and coddling, and no discipline, the soul of the child ends up as rotten as their teeth. Children need their vitamins. They need discipline. The balanced diet of consistent encouragement and instruction and discipline is foundational to the spiritual and moral development of a child. When, discipline, uh, when we discipline, it's critical, like our Heavenly Father, that we discipline not out of anger, that our children know this, but we discipline for the sake of consistent correction, the development of righteousness in our child, which is love. And it's further interesting here in verse 4 where Paul, he says, bring the children up, raise them. In the Greek here, it's ektrafete. It's the same word Paul used a few verses ago in Ephesians 5.29 when he talked about husbands nurturing and nourishing their wives. Parenting is not merely a matter of instruction and discipline, but it's nurturing. As Paul said, a husband's love for their wives, care for this person as if they were an extension of yourself. Paul says, don't exasperate your children, not with words, not with anger, not with your expectations, with your inconsistency or with your hypocrisy. It's critical that we become careful students of ourselves in order to become better instructors of our children. Where we fall short shouldn't be above confessing that we wronged our children, asking them for their forgiveness. Hopefully we can teach them to be forgiving of us as we are forgiving them. Like our Lord, as He parents us, we need to exercise tremendous patience, mercy, and grace to our children. Like our Father, offer hope to our children. Because we fallen people, our children are, we are fallen people, our children are no exception. And they recognize that we're no exception, they can see it. Our children need to know that our hope that our salvation, that our hope for growing and improving is in Christ. That the ultimate solution to any trouble in the home and in society is the individual regeneration of the heart. A new heart born again in Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, growing in Christ-like character. That is the answer. That's the calling on all of us tasked with rearing children. To instruct them and discipline them and point them to the Lord. To give them every opportunity to develop their own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That they may grow to know Him and love Him. And someday to have their own relationship with Him. To be imitators of Christ and ambassadors of truth to a lost and dying world. This is our task for today. It's our hope for the future. For all spheres of culture in every corner of the earth. For the well-being of the children and for the life of the world. And as a church, our hope is to be an extension of the gracious plan of God, to train our children in the way. And then our relationships and our character and our social structures in every way to be imitators of Christ, and a reflection of the character and structure shown forth in the Trinity. Be a place where the hearts of parents is turned toward their children, the hearts of children is turned toward their parents, where each of us sows into the future of our youth, and all of us collectively point one another as a faithful witness to the world, to Christ. And if you've heard the instruction of our Heavenly Father, you want to profess that you're a child of God. If you want to honor and obey God's commands and you want to submit to His perfect care, then honor His will today and take Christ as your Lord and Savior. If your heart's crying out, let it be, Lord, according to your will, if you're ready to submit your life and to give yourself to him and declare Jesus Christ as your Lord, come on up and take that first step of faith. Come up here and let it be known that you're ready to give yourself to him. And if you're ready to commit to membership, 
If you're ready to lean in together with us, each of us helping one another to raise each other up to grow up together into the likeness of Christ. I invite you to come forward, unite with us as we give ourselves to one another for the future of Christ's kingdom here in Grant County. Whatever the next step is for you, when you're ready to take it, I'll be up front.